Gracias. <laughs> My español is, is, isn't sufficient to give the lecture, so bear with me in English. Uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, always to come to a place that one of our former fellows trained. i it in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is a small city, but is the birthplace of intensive care in the United States. Uh, the field of intensive care began under the great leadership of Peter Saffer, who came from Vienna to Pittsburgh uh, in 1960. And just to give you an idea, our program, we have um, a 46-bed intensive care unit for children. We have 14 fellows, subspecialty fellows, 13 faculty. So it's a, it's a monster program, and we're very fortunate. And we're, we have that because we have built a, a big program related to acquiring funding from the National Institutes of Health to link research to patient care. We have equal amounts of work in the laboratory, in animal and cell culture models, in human trials on children and adults, and in, of course, clinical care. And since I thought that this would be mostly a clinical audience, I'm going to tell you about our clinical research that is going on, largely in children. Uh, it's impossible to talk about the Saffer Center without telling you a little bit about Peter Saffer. Peter Saffer is a famous professor uh, in the University of Pittsburgh. He was nominated twice for the Nobel Prize. He is the person that developed CPR. And in the 1950s, this was how CPR was done. It was useless. It was called the back pressure arm lift method. And Peter Saffer said, this is totally worthless. We are murdering patients by doing this. And so what he did was he and his colleagues paralyzed each other with curare and did mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation to prove that you actually could ventilate a patient with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And this was in 1957, and these were extremely famous experiments. And obviously now, with institutional review boards and ethics committees, it would be difficult. Now you can see this is Felix Steiking. He is showing if you don't manage the airway properly, you don't move in the air. <laughs> Felix Steichen was a surgical resident who volunteered 13 times for this. They taught the Boy Scouts, the public, and it went on to ultimately be coupled to chest compressions and broke the field open for the first use of CPR. They then, of course, developed the mannequin with Esmond Lairdal, Recessi Annie, and needless to say, CPR became worldwide. And Peter Saffer then, at that point, had just moved to Pittsburgh, and when he moved to Pittsburgh, there were two anesthesiologists at the University of Pittsburgh, 20 nurse anesthetists. And when he finished as chairman of anesthesia in 1979, he had 120 anesthesiologists that he had recruited to give you some idea of his impact on the field. We are interested in anything related to neurointensive care, but obviously I can't talk for three days. So we're just going to talk about two diseases, traumatic brain injury, which is our most important disease in children, and cardiac arrest. We view cardiac arrest as a neurological disease because obviously the patients that make it to the intensive care unit, it's the brain that is determining ultimate outcome. Neuroprotection, first let's start with what do we know? What are we sure of? Well, first we think of the continuum of care. To us, neuro, you have to think from the field all the way to rehabilitation. 
And I'm very fortunate in my center to have investigators in emergency medicine, critical care medicine, neurosurgery, surgery, and rehabilitation. So we have the continuum spectrum all the way through. And that is true for both children and adults. We know that every step is important. And we have a sense that what happens early is very critical. That you have the first few minutes to hours. After that, that's not to say that what we do isn't important. But we think that if we do the right things early, we'll have a much better chance to have an easier time of it later. And so to us, neuroprotection is this whole continuum. And then we also have rehabilitation, where we have to deal with the circuitry that we're left with. And we either repair, remodel, replace. And these two fields we are trying to unify. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that. What else do we know? Uh, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, a, I guess you would say an infamous politician in the United States, had a saying. and he, he said that there are things that we know that we know. And there are things that we know that we don't know. But there are also some things that we don't know that we don't know. And it's a little complicated, but I think in that last category, there's a lot we don't know that we don't know. And I'll try to show you some of these things as we go through and how we're trying to move them up to something that we know. This may not be so bad because another famous character, Yoda, used to say, if the brain were simple to understand, too simple to understand it, we as humans would be. So maybe not all is not so bad. It needs to be complicated to have us be as sophisticated as we are. So it's a big challenge. And we also know what we know is that it's a, there are many, many roadblocks to developing something that works. The brain's complicated. We don't understand all the secondary injury mechanisms. If we give a drug, does it get across the blood-brain barrier? What are the levels of it? The brain's vulnerable. In just a few minutes, 8, 10, 12 minutes after a cardiac arrest, you're in big trouble. There's a short time window. Uh, we give a lot of drugs that affect the brain, and we don't know for sure. Sedatives, for instance, how does that impact outcome? The brain's difficult to monitor. We have the skull in the way. We can't do the same thing and look at someone's perfusion and say it's good. Um, the insults are heterogeneous. People may have had a previous injury, and now they have another one on top of it. There are genetics predispositions like uh, APOE and uh, TNF polymorphisms that can affect brain injury. Uh, and there are extracerebral complications. The injury evolves in the brain, but what happens if you become hypoxic or you're hemorrhaging in the ICU? All of these things then impact outcomes. So it's pretty complicated. So let's take a look at what we know a little bit. And one of the things I think we all know is the brain is really vulnerable if it's been injured to a second insult. And uh, I think this is one of the most important things. And in fact, it's the fundamental tenet of neurointensive care. We may not know how to manipulate the damage that's evolving, but we better know not to let bad things happen to an injured brain in the ICU. And the classic work has been shown in both adults and children that if you have, for instance, a head injury, and you take that patient, and you either make them hypotensive or you make them hypoxemic, it, which happens commonly, either at the scene or in the ICU. It doubles to triples mortality, largely increases morbidity. If you're interested, the papers are classic. In adults, it's Randy Chestnut's paper. In children, it's Frank Pigula's paper. It's been shown over and over and over. So prevention of secondary insults is the central tenet of neurocritical care. But what don't we know about this? 
We don't know what's the time window of vulnerability of the injured brain. Is, is a patient with a head injury vulnerable to a second insult only for a few days? Or what about a week later and they're still in the ICU? What are the optimal blood pressure, cerebral perfusion pressure, brain tissue oxygen level, arterial sat? Uh, do these targets change over time? Are they different for a head injury or a cardiac arrest or a child abuse victim or a patient with meningitis? Are they different in different brain regions? Are they age dependent? Is there a safe level above which for these that we could always feel confident? Uh, and is too much, how much is too much? Uh, one of the other things, it's a little bit of a complicated concept, but I think it could be important in that is maybe damage from secondary insult is more reversible than primary damage. For instance, you have two patients that come in, two kids, they're both four-year-olds. They both have a Glasgow coma scale of four when you see them. One of them has the CT on the left a pretty bad brain injury. The one on the right just has some diffuse axonal injury, but has a GCS of four because they were hypotensive at the scene. And so it's a combination of the two that gave you a GCS of four on the right and the primary brain injury that gave it on the left. Which patient has a better chance to, be, uh, to have a good outcome if you manage them? What's curious is now, in clinical trials of head injury, all the patients on the right have been excluded from trials because people say, we want to study pure brain injury. And I think those patients on the right actually might be more amenable to a new therapy than the ones on the left. And yet, we haven't even tried to tackle that. These kind of concepts, I think, haven't really been thought through, pro through properly. And uh, so I think we need more information. Secondary insults are bad, but I think from a new therapy standpoint, we shouldn't exclude them from trials. We need, we need to look at how's the best way to treat a patient like that. Clinical trials need to be done on them. What else do we know? We know that if you heat the brain after an injury, if injured brain in the first few days has a fever, it's terrible. There's no question. The animal studies are overwhelming, and the human data show basically the same thing. Now, of course, we could never randomize patients to raising their temperature for an hour or two versus not. That would be unethical. And, but the studies that have been done, and I think the best study on this is uh, the LAPTUC study from Sitha Shankaran's neonatal multicenter trial, where they looked in the control group the control group, the quote-unquote normothermic group, and they looked at the incidence of hyperthermia. And remarkably, a three- to four-fold odds of worse outcome, death or disability, for just one degree centigrade. And so um, I think, in general, we do a poor job of this. Just walk through your ICU and look at how many patients with a brain injury have had a fever. Well, after they have a fever, you respond to it. But we have been very interested in trying to clamp temperature. It's, it's more doable in the adults with the cooling catheters. It's more challenging in children. And we just published a paper that I'd like to show you about. Uh, it's uh, on EPUB ahead of print. Uh, Mike Bell, uh, who uh, Dr. Sanchez Toledo worked with on some of his research, and Erica Fink, one of our young investigators, did something that we're trying to call targeted temperature management. Instead of waiting for the fever and then giving Tylenol and other things and a cooling blanket to bring it down, give a bolus of IV ice saline as you see the temperature is going, going up. And when they did this, by giving, uh, uh, you could see about 18 cc's per kilo of ice saline over 15 minutes, they were able to very promptly control brain temperature better than with a cooling blanket. And this also can be used in children and adults to induce hypothermia, uh, rather than just try to do it with a cooling blanket. And it's a very interesting strategy. I think this is just one example of a way to try to tackle this.
uh, but my whole point is that I think we need better ways to prevent fever from happening in someone with a head injury or a stroke or a cardiac arrest because heat injures brain. Uh, one of the questions, though, is how long should you try to man man uh, meticulously control fever after a head injury? I don't know the answer to that. Is it the animal studies have said maybe 48 or 72 hours, but no one has really comprehensively examined this. And if four or five days after a head injury, someone's still comatose and they spike a fever, are you damaging brain with it? Uh, the answer to that is unclear. I think it's something that deserves an answer. Another thing we know is bad for the injured brain, hyponatremia. You have no idea how many times in the United States I've been asked to represent hospitals in medical malpractice cases. And uh, I don't really have time to do it very often. But seeing hypothermia develop at the time of, a, uh, of an event, uh, of a, a herniation or a deterioration, extremely common. And sometimes it just appears out of the blue. And whether it is SIADH or whether it is cerebral salt wasting, um, it, as you can see in the CT on the left, which is one you'd rather not have than the one on the right, in the same patient with two different sodiums, it can be a big problem. And uh, I think one of the things that has been emerging in the neurocritical care literature, both in adults and children, I think is extremely important. And that is, now what we really need to do is never use hypotonic fluids in a brain-injured patient. We should be using normal saline or hypertonic fluids. Prevent this. Don't let it happen. We've only really learned over time. One of my mentors was Brad Peterson at San Diego Children's. And if you followed this literature, Brad Peterson has led the world in the implementation and use of hypertonic saline. He really broke the field open and pushed adult intensive care, adult neurocritical care. It's one of the places where pediatrics has led the way. And uh, the, the use of hypertonic saline either to prevent hyponatremia or to mild or modestly increase osms and prevent intracranial hypertension, I think is really sweeping the country, if not the world. And uh, this was a paper from Latin America showing something very similar to this, uh, and that you can prevent iatrogenic hypothermia, uh, hyponatremia in brain injured patients and other patients in your ICU. It's a simple thing to do. Uh, this deserves additional study. Certainly, we don't know everything about it. What's the safe osm limit? Uh, how slowly should you uh, <coughs> re reduce the sodium? These are all issues that deserve to be carefully explored. But we do know that acute development of hyponatre hyponatremia in a brain-injured patient can be devastating. But there's a lot we don't know. And before we talk about some future therapies or what we're studying right now, I wanted to cover a couple of examples of how I think stupid we are about what we are trying to do in neurocritical care. And let's just take a couple of simple examples of trying to optimize standard practice in the ICU. Nutrition and metabolic support. What do we do? What's best for the brain? Well, if you look in the laboratory data, hyperglycemia is detrimental. Uh, the classic studies, I could give you 100 papers on this. But then you see Paul Vespa's important paper from UCLA just a few years ago where they did tight glucose control on a bunch of head injured adults. They put microdialysis probes in and measured lactate, glutamate, and what did they find when you do tight glucose control to glucose of around 80? The brain in the injured regions shows evidence of a metabolic crisis. And in some of the patients, the brain tissue glucose levels went to zero. And so what's the right answer here? We don't know. Nutrition, 
every study you look in the trauma literature, start feeding early. You reduce mortality. I certainly believe that. Then you see studies like Pat Sullivan's study from the University of Kentucky when they took animals, gave them a head injury, and starved them for two days rather than fed them for two days. And wow, what did they find? The starved animals developed some ketosis and the, uh, the amount of brain damage they had was dramatically reduced. And so I'm not telling you to go out and starve all your patients. I'm just showing you this as an example is I'm not sure we know what the right fuel for the injured brain is. And many people now are studying things, not just glucose, but beta-hydroxybutyrate, actually lactate as a fuel, because lactate can be used by neurons, for example. So it's very complicated. I'm not saying I have the answer, but I think we really need to study and explore what's the optimal nutrition for the injured brain. And it might not just be standard feedings or glucose. And I think we really need to have an open mind and, and think about that. Here's another example, supplemental oxygen. What do we do with oxygen in the injured brain? Well, I showed you if you have secondary hypoxemia or sec after a brain injury, terrible. Increases mortality. Uh, the SATs in these studies that were considered to be severe hypoxemia, maybe SATs around 70. Uh, some people would say 80, arterial saturation. Uh, and so none of us would argue those are bad sets, certainly in an adult, uh, and even in a child. Um, but then you have papers like Gary Fiskum's work, where if you take an animal model of cardiac arrest, and this is in an adult animal, give it V-fib and resuscitate it on room air or 100%, the animals resuscitated on room air have way less brain damage than the ones on 100%. Well, then, well, what's the right answer here? And then, you know, now, in, in, and I don't know if you use it here, but certainly every patient in both adult and pediatric neurotrauma in the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center gets a brain tissue oxygen Lycox monitor. Could be a one-month-old, could be a 70-year-old. We, they all get a brain tissue oxygen, and we titrate first to ICP and CPP, but if they're good and their brain tissue O2 level is low, we then do interventions to target that. And people have said, well, maybe the level of 10 or 15 or 20 is a critical threshold, and that we could further improve outcomes from head injury by doing this. And so the use of higher FiO2s, and I would call them flow-promoting strategies to try to improve brain tissue oxygen is now very common in a number of centers in the US. But then you get papers like this that I was fortunate to write the editorial on for the Journal of the American Medical Association that just came out last year, the Kilgannon study, a kind of a shocking study, showing that a PaO2 of greater than 300 was as bad as a PaO2 less than 60 in adults over 24 hours after cardiac arrest. It's a little bit of a scary study. In part, you'd say, why did the adults have PAO2s greater than 300? We wouldn't allow it. But I think if you just go to you know, the average non-major academic center, you would find that this is not that rare. And so what is the right oxygen titration? Uh, and so in our centers, we are trying to use brain tissue PO2 levels, not just arterial PO2. But we don't have the answer to this. And again, I'm not telling you what the answer is. I'm telling you, here are two staples of neurocritical care, nutrition and oxygen, and we're not exactly sure what to do with them. Okay? Uh, Peter Saffer would say, it's our duty as critical care physician to define the optimal critical care of the brain injured patient. So we have a lot of work to do on these. What don't we know also? Well, certainly let's look at head injury. In head injury, we have beautiful guidelines. We have a lot of therapies we use. I think many of them have excellent effects. You all saw the, uh, probably the New England Journal study two weeks ago, Jamie Cooper's decompressive 
a craniectomy trial showing that if you just take the skull off and then remove all the neurocritical care, you have beautiful ICP control, but the patients come out terrible. And that suggests that there's more to brain therapy than just controlling ICP. And maybe all the therapies we give have a benefit on other aspects. And so this is mostly ICP directed. But we certainly have a lot of therapies. We don't know exactly the best combination. And one of the things we need are good comparative studies of both the first tier and these second tier therapies. Right now, whether you use barbiturates, hypothermia, and this is in head injury now, uh, escalate hyperventilation or decompression in the United States depends on the center. Some centers like hypothermia, some like decompression. It's still, as we call it, dealer's choice. Uh, <clears throat> for cardiac arrest, what is the brain-oriented therapy and monitoring? I say it's pitiful. We take the patient, put them on a slab, basically monitor cardiac. We don't really do much in the way of brain monitoring, maybe nears. Is their blood pressure OK? We treat seizures if they happen. I say we pray for divine intervention. But of course, in that setting, we do have one therapy that has been shown to be effective. Uh, and, uh, and of course, that's hypothermia, which has been shown both in adult V-fib and, of course, perinatal asphyxia. We'll talk a little bit more about hypothermia in a minute, because obviously our center had a huge impact on the development of hypothermia. Uh, <clears throat> In traumatic brain injury, I mentioned cerebral perfusion pressure and ICP control are felt to be important. But as I mentioned, I don't think they're enough. And this is a new paper we just published uh, a couple months ago in the journal Developmental Neuroscience. In head injury, the group of patients, if you're a pediatric neurointensive care or neurosurgeon, you know the group that does terrible. They're the infants. And mostly, they're the child abuse victims, the shaken babies. They, they have a terrible outcome. Many of them do very poorly. <clears throat> Most people don't even measure intracranial, intracranial pressure in them. Many people are very pessimistic about them. We treat them no differently than any patient. We put intracranial pressure monitors in them, brain tissue oxygen monitors, and try to see what we can do and understand. This is a brand new paper that just came out, and I think the findings are really interesting. If you look in this group, there were 11 infants that had a bad outcome. This is with a head injury, traumatic brain injury, mostly from child abuse. And look at their intracranial pressure. These are the 11 that had a bad outcome. There are only two kids that had ICP problems. We have 900 ICP readings recorded in the nursing record in these kids, and there are only eight readings out of 900 above 20. And yet these, these uh, uh, 11 kids, uh, uh, had nine of them had bad outcome. So obviously I say, boy, we need a different target. We don't know what the target is, but we need a different target. And one of the things we are working on both in the laboratory is to try to find out, is it axonal injury? Is it hemorrhage? Is it ischemia? Is it apoptosis? Uh, what mechanism is it that is causing the, the evolution of brain injury in these infants? They have a different kind of injury. Uh, and, and this tells you that you can have a bad outcome with head injury. We all know you can have a bad outcome with cardiac arrest or asphyxia without a high ICP. But people in general have felt most of the patients with head injury have a bad outcome because they have refractory intracranial hypertension. And that's clearly not the case for the infants. Uh, one of the other things that people have talked about recently, if you've kept your eye on head injury, I think is really important. And this is Jeff Manley's theory. And if you're interested in this, this was published in the Journal of Neurotrauma. Uh, it, this is actually the cover of that issue. Kathy Satman is the first author of it. And one of the things that people have talked about in head injury is maybe we shouldn't think of it as one disease. 
maybe trying to treat head injury as one disease would be just like trying to treat cancer as one disease. Because look, here's the CTs. Every one of these patients had a GCS of four, Glasgow Coma Scale of four. One's an epidermal, a contusion, diffuse axonal injury, subdural, subarachnoid, diffuse swelling. So you look at this, and of course you could throw child abuse on there for pediatric and has a totally different CT also. And so you'd say, have we been wrong? Is this one disease? Is the reason it's been so hard to get a randomized controlled trial of anything to work in head injury because we need to look at these as different diseases, not as one disease. And here, as you can see, an abusive head trauma in a child could even represent another. So maybe pediatrics is even more difficult. Maybe we need an entirely new classification system, not to say GCS is worthless, but it might not be the right metric to launch a clinical trial. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about with, with hypothermia of how this may be really true as to why hypothermia hasn't worked in head injury, has in asphyxia. Uh, there have been few RCTs done in head injury. None of them have been positive. We have just launched another type of approach, and that is called a comparative effectiveness trial. One of the difficulties in head injury in children are numbers. And our center is one of the most prolific of entering patients into head injury trials. But one of the difficulties is, is that some centers will treat you know, two or three a month, and others will treat 10 a month. And if you're not doing a lot of patients, you're, you're not as good at doing a clinical trial, and it's really hard to do them. And so one way is to just let's see what different units are doing right now and see if we can see something break through and say, wow, the, if you do 10 ICUs and you say, the three that are using this strategy all have better outcome, normalized for baseline severity of illness. And this is a strategy that's been effective in other diseases. And so this is one that we're tackling right now in an application we have to the NIH. This might be a, a something that could be very valuable to pediatrics. It is even being contemplated on the adult side. Now with hypothermia in two trials and uh, the decompression all failing. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that we have done in Pittsburgh that I'm very proud of is we have something very special. We call it a pediatric neurocritical care service. Patients that have brain insults of any kind are seen by a team that are four National Institute of Health funded faculty. Uh, as I said, we have about 13 or 14 faculty. Four of them focus on neuro. And so whether you have a head injury, whether you have status epilepticus, whether you have a cardiac arrest, they go around and make recommendations for optimal approach to these kids. And all of these kids, almost all of them, are entered into a different clinical trial into a database, into a, into a randomized trial, many of them funded by the NIH. Taking this approach now has given us a tremendous bolus of academic output and protocolized much of what we do, not just in one disease, but in many of the diseases that have neurologic complications. Uh, just to give you an idea, in the last two years, these are the publications all on clinical care of these different diseases from our pediatric neurocritical care service. So just from an academic output standpoint alone, this has been a fabulous development. And obviously, we believe it's really improved care. We're working on now uh, a cohort study to compare to prior to the service to after the service to see if we can see improvements in outcome. But to give you some ideas, I said every patient with a severe head injury gets two ICP monitors, one to continuously drain CSF, one parenchymal monitor to continuously measure ICP, a brain tissue O2 monitor, and so they have a very high level of, uh, of, of care. And uh, as I said, I think this has been an educational, academic success for us. Now, that's a little bit about what we know and what we don't know, just a little bit about the future. As I mentioned, we all really feel that for cardiac arrest and perinatal asphyxia, there's been a breakthrough. 
we have hypothermia. Sure, it doesn't work in everyone, but if you would have told me 10 years ago that we would have a therapy that can improve outcome, even as in the Fritz Sturz hypothermia trial, out of every fifth patient that we cool, people would have said that's a phenomenal development because no one thought the brain was able, going, going to be able to be improved in any way in those patients. I must say that we're very proud that Fritz Sturz in um, Vienna, of course, one of our fellows led the European multicenter hypothermia trial. And so obviously with Peter Saffer uh, and our whole team, we had quite a bit to do with the, on the adult side with the development and ultimate implementation of hypothermia for VFib cardiac arrest in adults. Uh, the work in neonatology from Gunn's group and other groups uh, uh, then really pushed this in neonatal care. And uh, there are several studies ongoing in pediatric critical care, and I'll tell you a little bit about those. Uh, obviously, there are still many unknowns about this. What's the right duration? What's the right temperature? Does it work in adults just in V-fib and not other rhythms? In the neonatal arena, who does it work on? And, uh, and, and so there's many, many questions. And when you think about it, hypothermia affects so many things and does have some toxicities that unless it really had a big benefit, we would have never been able to see it show a benefit on patients. It would have too many complications. Um, and so in, in the pediatric arena, we were faced with this dilemma. On adults, 24 hours for V-fib. In uh, oh, children, it's actually not 48, 72 hours for, uh, for, for, ne for neonates. Uh, the FAPCA trial in children is 48 hours. So what is really the best way? And Erica Fink, one of our investigators now, is doing a single center trial in children with cardiac arrest, comparing 24 and 72 hours. And we're, because it's only a single center trial and we're not going to have 300 patients, we thought we would use our expertise that we have in Pittsburgh and look at some interesting surrogate biomarkers. We have a great deal of expertise in serum biomarkers. And for example, in every one of these patients, we're doing S100 NSE, myelin basic protein, entire Luminex panel of cymox, cytokines, chemokines, growth factor, several proteomics panels. And I'll show you some of that data. And in addition, all of these kids are also getting magnetic resonance spectroscopic studies of brain lactate levels and brain uh, N acetyl aspartate levels. Once they're rewarmed, they're then taken to the MR. And so we're comparing one day and three days of cooling in them. Uh, and this is a really nice study. Erica is funded by the National Institute of Health as a young investigator, was one of our fellows. And just to give you an idea, I'll show, her, show you some of her biomarker data. People have said, oh, biomarkers, how good are they or whatever. I'll show you biomarker data from patients in a randomized trial where you have absolute tight control over everything. Part of the variability of biomarker, I think, is the sloppiest, sloppiness of all of us in collecting samples just in the day-to-day -day care of patients. If you rigorously put it into a protocol, here's what the data look like. Here's neuron-specific enolase. This is the initial 23 patients from her study. There's, there's patients who survived and not survived. You start to say, wow, there might be some potential promise on this. You could say maybe for prognostication, but also maybe for deciding who we should randomize. If on day one you see levels in a certain range, you could say, this is someone who has a chance to respond or doesn't, or this is someone maybe with too much damage, et cetera. Here is the ROC curve for this, and this is for mean 0.883. That's pretty good for any kind of, uh, of biological test. And uh, that's with a cutoff of 69 nanograms per mil of NSE. Uh, here's S100B from those same patients. Wow, of course, S100B has a shorter half-life. It's released. You very quickly see levels. So, S100, very rapid, NSE, a little bit later. Maybe we could start to think about combining these in a panel. 
The one patient that has these really high levels that go on and on, this was a patient with renal failure, and of course, S100B is renally excreted. And uh, so you need to know a little bit about your patients also. And look at the ROC curve for S100. Again, this is mean S100. This is as good as any study you'll ever see for an ROC curve. Another surprise, myelin basic protein. You know, white matter is much more resistant to ischemia than gray matter. The only exception to that is in preemies, who, when they develop periventricular leukomalacia, their white matter is vulnerable. Uh, but in older kids, in adults, white matter is much more resistant to ischemia. The ischemic threshold is about 7 mils per 100 gram per minute, unlike about 20 in gray matter. But you could see that myelin basic protein in the most severely poor outcome, and the patients in black are the patients who went on to die, and the patients in green are the patients who survived in each one of these. And so you could see the patients with severe injury they even have white matter damage that's detectable. And one of the thoughts was, and look at the ROC curve for this. Uh, oh, no, uh, here. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, now, what happens if you combine all the biomarkers and develop an ROC curve for the panel? These are really remarkably good. <laughs> the panel for the median or the panel for the mean, you ever see ROC curves that look perfect? I don't. And so this is very, very promising that a panel of biomarkers applied to patients with acute cardiac arrest within a trial. And right now, we have not broken the code on hypothermia versus normothermia because she's still in the study and has not. We have only looked at these from the standpoint of prognosis. Uh, so the, co the, the code for hypothermia versus normothermia and impact on outcome in MRS markers, we will see how they, how they do for predicting who may or may have not have responded to hypothermia or for at least comparing 24 to 72. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, so this is very, very exciting to us. A three biomarker panel put together for an ROC curve really has some potential. In every one of these patients, they get conventional magnetic resonance imaging, including diffusion-weighted imaging, apparent diffusion coefficient <laughs> maps, T1, T2, and they also get two-dimensional magnetic resonance spectroscopic maps of brain metabolites. And this is just an example of N-acetyl aspartate. When you lose it, when you have brain injury, you lose it. It is a normal mitochondrial constituent, so it gives you an idea of mitochondrial damage. And of course, lactate, a marker of anaerobic metabolism and or ongoing excitotoxicity and mitochondrial failure. Uh, and so uh, this is with Ashok Panagraphy, uh, uh, a, a very talented magnetic resonance spectroscopic expert uh, from the UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles who has come to Pittsburgh. And uh, I'm sorry this doesn't project better in the light, but this is just an example. The early scan is a, a day after rewarming, and the late scan is uh, several months after when this patient was seen in follow-up. And the findings are really remarkable. Uh, you could see early on, massive lactate peak. Normally, there's no lactate. The lactate peak is zero. Oh, great. And, uh, and then but you could see the real surprising finding that, look at several months after the injury in the thalamus, there's still a lactate peak. If you look in an animal that's had brain injury, the thalamus is generally filled with microglia and macrophages when it's injured. And so one possibility is this is a reflection of ongoing inflammation, for instance, in the thalamus. Uh, and so I think this is going to be really, really informative in these kids to see, A, what is the time course of this, and B, did it matter whether they got 24 or 72 hours of hypothermia? So this is just an example of the kind of study that is ongoing in children with a cardiac arrest in our unit. Uh, and as I say, we're in the midst of trying to analyze this uh, with relation to hypothermia. Another way that people now state-of-the-art are trying to tackle this is to look at 
tractography. Uh, this is with diffusion tensor imaging by MR. And this is just an example from one of our kids in the hypothermia trial. And you can quantify the amount of loss of the white matter tracks. This is now being, this was really spearheaded by the fact that so many soldiers and, uh, and football players uh, were being, uh, uh, U.S. football, the real violent thing, of course, you know, uh, where uh, they, were, they were having this neurodegenerative process where they are losing white matter. And so a lot, of, a lot of effort has gone into trying to map white matter tracks. And now this is starting to be used on everyone. And there are studies in neonatology. There are studies in children and studies in adults, both in head injury, cardiac arrest, stroke, trying to look at this and seeing what connectivity has been lost. It's not just neuronal loss, but it's connectivity, the fiber tracks. And so this is giving us an insight. And as I showed you, we have loss of myelin basic protein in our kids with cardiac arrest even. And so we feel that maybe this will tell us where it's happening. And so to map the quanti and quantify the white matter tract damage, I think could also be very valuable. Not only the damage, but the rewiring and the plasticity. A little bit now on what's in the future for traumatic brain injury. I mentioned that the hypothermia trials in head injury have failed in children and in adults. In children, most recently, of course, Jamie Hutchison study the Canadian multicenter hypothermia trial. What did they see? No benefit. A lot of problems during rewarming in head injured children when they were rewarming. And they rewarmed relatively fast, certainly much faster than we rewarm. But that was a place they got into a lot of trouble. Uh, Guy Clifton's trial, also hypotension during cooling, something seen much more commonly in a head trauma victim than in a cardiac arrest victim. One of the reasons for that may be in head trauma victims, they get a lot of osmolar therapy. And in essence, patients with head injury are much more dehydrated. We say we try to keep them euvolemic, but we really don't do that good of a job of it. And so now you take hypothermia, cold diuresis, they then have mannitol, hypertonic saline, dry them out even more. Then they may be breaking even. You rewarm them, vasodilate them, they drop their blood pressure. It's not a good combination. And so that's one of the things that gets you into trouble. The cool kids trial in uh, the United States was just stopped for futility. Uh, and so one of the questions you would ask, is there any hope for hypothermia in head injury? It's been successful in the neonates. It's been successful in adults with V-fib. Why is there any hope? Well, look at this new Guy Clifton trial that just came out. Uh, I believe this is in Lancet Neurology, published this year. Uh, it's a six-center randomized control trial. It was stopped for futility at the 108 patient mark. But then Guy Clifton went in and looked at the data, and what did he find? This goes back to that old slide I showed you earlier in my talk. If you look at the patients with diffuse injury that didn't have a focal contusion, diffuse injury, hypothermia was bad. It looked like it was pretty close to actually worsening outcome. If you look at the patients with surgically removed contusion, hypothermia showed a statistically significant benefit in those patients. And so, Maybe this gets back to head injury isn't one disease. If you have diffuse swelling and a diffuse injury or diffuse axonal injury, that's one approach. If you have a contusion, that's another disease. And so maybe you have to think of it like this. In this, maybe we should consider using hypothermia, or at least if it gets re-examined, focus on this group first. Whereas in the diffuse axonal injury, didn't seem to have an impact, and in fact, it was detrimental. And so maybe you get futility because these just cancel out. Another thought I have on this relates to uh, uh, another study that we did. And this is a study published in Developmental Neuroscience in 2006. This is, I think, a really neat study that we did. We, instead of studying one disease, because we're neurocritical care people, we said, Let's do biomarkers in the serum on three diseases in our ICU. 
kids with head injury, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, or child abuse. And so there were three different diseases in this. And here are the data. And the data are really surprising. Look up in the left corner. This is neuron-specific enolase in the serum from kids with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy from a cardiac arrest. And you see that there are big increases, in, and they're kind of delayed. The neuron-specific enolase takes several days in many of these kids to peak. So neuronal death after a cardiac arrest happens over time. <laughs> okay, and now the real surprise, it looks like there's delayed neuronal death. Look at the head injured kids. These are kids in motor vehicle accidents and that have falls, severe head injury. They have big increase initially, but we didn't see any delayed increases. And so you might say, if you're in a unit that is doing a good job controlling intracranial hypertension, what's the target? Maybe you need to get hypothermia on in five minutes to have an effect on these kids. Whereas in this, you might have an hour. You, might have, you, you, you may have a little bit more of, of an opportunity. Uh, people don't, have not thought about this. The kinetics of these different diseases of the time course of neuronal death, axonal injury, et cetera, I think are very, very different. And here was the other surprise that we saw. Look up in the upper right corner. Child abuse. Child, I'm sorry about that. Child abuse actually looks more like hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy than it does head injury. We would have never predicted that. And it's interesting that some people suggest that child abuse victims have this kind of pattern because when they're injured, oftentimes, uh, you know, the perpetrator is it known it might be the babysitter or the boyfriend? And the mom comes back a couple hours later and then finds the kid in trouble. Or the next morning, the kids maybe had seizures overnight. Uh, and so, and maybe the kid has been strangled in addition to beaten. And so the pattern in child abuse looks more like hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So would a child abuse victim benefit from hypothermia? more than a head injury victim. We don't know the answer to that. But this kind of investigation to us is starting to tell us what's really going on in the brain. We don't have the answers. And if you say, well, this, this is just bogus. I don't believe this. I say, OK, what's a disease we know that hypothermia works in? V-fib cardiac arrest in adults. What happens if you look at that? And this is a beautiful study that's been done. If you look at a randomized controlled trial of V-fib cardiac arrest in adults, you look at neuron-specific enolase levels in blood, and you look over time, and it's exactly what we would predict. The hypothermia group have attenuated levels. Look at the normothermia group. It's the delayed increase. It's prevented by hypothermia. And so you look at this and you say, hey, maybe these biomarkers are better than we thought. I think we don't believe biomarkers are everything. They're just going to be one more tool to add to your armamentarium with imaging and, and invasive monitoring and non-invasive monitoring. But I think this is a good example to show you that there really is some delayed neuronal death after a cardiac arrest, and hypothermia seems to prevent either it from happening or at least its release into the circulation. Uh, so what about hypothermia? What might the future hold? I say it depends on the target. So in a perinatal HIE, V-fib, or asphyxial arrest in children, the brain's the primary target. But of course, the whole organism, the whole patient, is exposed to damage, the heart, other organs. Use mild systemic hypothermia. In head in, and, and right now in children, we have the FAPCA trial for all comers, multi-center, big NIH-funded trial. And we have the Pittsburgh 24 versus 72 that I showed you. And we are participating in both. In head injury, the brain is the target. Maybe we have been wrong in cooling the whole body. Maybe we ought to think about just trying to cool the head in TBI. We know from the neonatal work it doesn't do as good a job on the subcortical structures as the cortical structures when you just cool the head. But in TBI, it may be enough, and you may not get the side effects. So just a theory, just a theory.
And in groups where hypothermia is not effective, we certainly want to prevent fever. Maybe we need some drugs that mimic hypothermia, optimize hypothermia by, by, by some strategy that either uses a, a lesser temperature reduction or, or combines it with better neurointensive care. Or maybe we need to add the right drug to, to hypothermia of 35 degrees, for example. Uh, these are all unclear. And finally, what about in head injury possibility of drugs? Let me just give you a little bit about right now what I feel and are being tested in clinical trials, drugs for traumatic brain injury. Well, you need to know the targets. Well, in head injury, the targets are direct disruption of the tissue, metabolism and blood flow mismatch, early cell death triggers, excitotoxicity, mitochondrial failure, proteolysis, oxidative stress, leading to cell death by necrosis, apoptosis, or autophagy. Then there's a cell swelling component, which could be vasogenic edema, astrocyte swelling, which is cytotoxic edema, contusion, tissue osmolar load, vascular dysregulation. And then, of course, there's direct axonal injury, shearing of the axons, and there's inflammation superimposed upon this. So these are the mechanisms. Are there any drugs that people think might, we might be able to target this with? Again, other than our current therapy, mannitol, hypertonic saline, barbiturates, what's new? Uh, there are many drugs in, that are, that there's a lot of funding right now in the US, much of it from the United States Army because of the problem with the United States soldiers being uh, uh, attacked by terrorists with the improvised explosive devices. And there's been a lot of head injury because their body armor is protecting them from the blast, but the helmet doesn't. Because a blast wave can get in through the eyes and ears, and you obviously need to be able to see and hear. And so uh, this is a big problem, and it, the US Army has been funding a lot of research on this. And here are some of the drugs, and I'll just tell you a little bit about a couple of the clinical trials. Again, no definitive answer, but this is what to keep your eye out for. Okay, these are some of the drugs. Excitotoxicity, we know is a target, and if you want a paper to really understand this best, go to Paul Vespa's paper. This is a paper in the journal Critical Care Medicine, and uh, one of the things that in a great ICU at UCLA where patients receive all kind of therapy, even dilantin, ICP monitoring, microdialysis, PET scans. I mean, this is a state-of-the-art place. And what did they do when they did continuous EEG on these head-injured patients? They saw that 22% of their patients were still in subclinical status epilepticus. So despite everyone thinking we're in cruise control here. We've got great ICU care, 21%, and it correlated with ICP spikes. It correlated with uh, poorer outcome and, uh, and had enduring effects. The patients that had this had ICP problems for, uh, for 100 hours. And so this tells you this is still a target. How might we target this? Oh, and by the way, there's a beautiful paper that was presented at the World Congress a couple weeks ago in Sydney by Julia Gunn showing this is very common after cardiac surgery in infants and children also, the incidence of unrecognized subclinical status epilepticus. Maybe the reason for the somewhat lower IQ in some of the patients with cyanotic heart disease, et cetera, is some low-level brain injury that we haven't been dealing with. Uh, some of the new therapies, obviously, we should be continuous EEG monitoring on every patient. Every head injured child in Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh gets continuous EEG. Uh, and that's true in several centers, but not many in the US. It, why aren't we monitoring? Is it less important than the EKG? I, I don't see why. Part of it is many of the child neurologists feel overwhelmed because there's so many EEGs to read and there's the medical legal liability, but we need to somehow get around that and come up with a strategy because brain is as important as anything else. Uh, obviously, optimizing anticonvulsants. Some novel therapies. One that's been shown to combine with hypothermia in the neonatal investigation is xenon gas. Could be very easy to administer. 
Uh, that's just one example I pick. The extrasynaptic NMDA antagonists, different than the classical NMDA antagonists, are another area to keep your eye on. What about edema? We've used mannitol and hypertonic saline forever. Isn't there anything new we can use for brain edema? And probably the most interesting area in this is progesterone. There's been a number of studies in animal models uh, led by Don Stein in the laboratory and led by David Wright at Emory, uh, who have, have published a beautiful paper on this. There's a big NIH-funded, huge clinical trial of this in head injury right now. Progesterone in animal models reduces brain edema. It, it works better in males than females. Uh, it also, though, people would call it a dirty drug. It's a little bit of an anticonvulsant. It's also a little bit of an antioxidant. It also induces some anti-inflammatory effects, probably related to NF-kappa B. And so this is a really interesting strategy. It, uh, it lowered mortality rate in their clinical feasibility study. And also there's a very promising study in RCT from China, published in intensive care medicine. And so this is in big clinical trials in the US right now. I call it, maybe it's not just an anti-edema therapy, but it's a combination therapy, if you'd like to think of it. Uh, so keep your eye on that. The nice thing about it is it doesn't lower blood pressure when you get it. It doesn't seem to do anything to, to the animals and or the patients in the day which pioneered the development of liver transplants. We get a lot of patients with liver failure from various causes sent to us. And if you combine... Uh, Probenicid with N-acetylcysteine, you can increase the brain levels because probenicid is kicked out of the brain by a P-glycoprotein transporter. And so it's a way to can keep probenicid, uh, keep, probenicid is a way to keep N-acetylcysteine in neurons. In cell culture, it does a tremendous job of this and actually increases glutathione levels. Um, the rationale for this is Julia Bayer's paper that we published in Pediatric Research in 2002, a highly cited paper showing that in kids with head injury, they develop progressive loss of antioxidants. Uh, there's a big spike in lipid peroxidation, progressive loss of glutathione, uh, and uh, dramatic loss of, uh, of ascorbate. Here you can see over time. Uh, progressive loss of total antioxidant reserve. So we feel there's a strong, especially in children and uh, undoubtedly in infants also. Infants have a little different story, particularly with their ability to uh, deal with hydrogen peroxide. Uh, and, uh, but, so that's the basis for this trial. Targeting oxidative stress, I think pretty logical. This has just launched uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, Julia also says, if you want, I'm just going to show you two examples of something really futuristic. And one, mostly from animal data, Julia says, for oxidative stress, it's location that matters. And they have these new antioxidants. They're called hemigramicidin temple conjugates that concentrate in the mitochondria. And of course, the mitochondria are where most of the free radicals are made. And so if you use these drugs, they are interesting. They're a piece of an antibiotic, uh, uh, gramicidin, and an antioxidant is linked to them. And if you take an animal and you, and you uh, inject these and you take out the brain and you measure in the cytosolic fraction versus the mitochondrial fraction, there's a several thousand-fold concentration of the antioxidant right in the mitochondria. And these are the structure of these antioxidants, if you're interested in them. And she has some really exciting work in both head injury, uh, hemorrhagic shock, and also in radiation-induced uh, injury. Uh, those are the three diseases that these seem to be showing very powerful effects on. So keep your eye on this. It's kind of a futuristic trial. But they have a whole library of hundreds of these, and they, they look very, very promising. Uh, what about, I mentioned the combined head injury and hemorrhagic shock, uh, that it has a, a lot of damage, but it might be reversible. And the agent that we are most interested in, and we just published a paper last month or the month before in the journal Critical Care Medicine on, is this drug called polynitroxylated pegylated hemoglobin. It's an artificial hemoglobin 
that has 14 nitroxide antioxidants covalently linked to it and uh, um, uh, 8 to 10 polyethylene glycols. And so when you give this, it is a non-toxic hemoglobin that acts as an antioxidant, blood volume expander, and colloid. It's kind of a multifaceted drug. And uh, if you're interested, you can look at the paper. But this is just an example of neuronal death in the hippocampus, shown in green with fluorojade, uh, a week after head injury plus shock in animals resuscitated with this, rather than hexstand, the colloid hexstand, or lactated ringers. And it seems to have some really nice effects. And it also lowers ICP. You can see if you're resuscitating with this rather than lactated ringers, if you lose lactated ringers, your ICP is 20. With PNPH, your ICP is low. So these are just, again, kind of futuristic. The last thing I'd like to say, I mentioned rehab, and I just want to show you one example that we think is a very exciting and important example in rehab. Amy Wagner and our group, a physiatrist, um, NIH-funded investigator in new approaches to rehab of patients, says, you know, I think dealing with rewiring the injured brain has got as much potential as trying to save the brain early. And uh, in Pittsburgh, as you know, and probably in many centers in Europe, hypothermia has now been used routinely in adults with cardiac arrest. And 55% of all adults system-wide in uh, the University of Pittsburgh that have a cardiac arrest get hypothermia. We have a hypothermia service where the interns are given a little yellow card that says, if you have a patient with a cardiac arrest, call this number, and we will bring a team in and help you administer hypothermia. And it has really done a fabulous job of providing consistent care. And so 55% of all cardiac arrests have qualified for hypothermia. And in the past, patients with cardiac arrest were not felt to be good candidates for rehab. I don't know what your approach here is, but the global brain insults tended to not respond to rehab. A head injured patient might respond to Ritalin or Amantadine or Bromocryptin and, and conventional rehab, and they'd come back a year later in the unit and they'd not be, be doing reasonably well. Cardiac arrest, we didn't see that. Well, here's an example of a patient that came to Pittsburgh. 47-year-old female collapsed in the kitchen. Her 18-year-old daughter, who really didn't know how to do CPR, did some kind of CPR. She went to the local emergency room by ambulance, of course. The doctor called the local uh, tertiary care center, and they said, I just withdraw support. She's brain agonists. I'd just like to close by thanking you for your attention and saying that Peter Saffer used to always say, it's our duty as clinician scientists to search for breakthroughs, not p-values. So thank you very much. I'm more than willing to try to answer any questions. Don't be shy. Anyone? Yes. Being practical, I think the pediatrics will have a big concern. Is who we need to call? Um, and I think that there is guidance that say that you have a good exam, do not pull the key. But what does a good exam mean? So, which kids that go to cardiac arrest we need to pull? Well, that's a really great question. It's like the million dollar question. Uh, I guess I should say the million euro question since the euro is worth more than the dollar. Uh, uh, there's, I think, a lot of interesting nuances from that. I think the first thing, if you go back and you look at how was hypothermia able to be able to be shown to be successful in a clinical trial? If you go back to Fritz Sturr's European multicenter trial, he screened 3,000 patients and randomized, what was it, 400, something like that. And so I call his trial the filet mignon of cardiac arrest. It's the finest cut. It, it 
and to see the to see an effect through the noise of a cardiac arrest trial is really difficult. And so to be able to have a shot, if you just tried to randomize everyone, it would have never had a chance. So he went with V-fib initially, and he had very strict entry criteria. OK. Um, and the neonatal trials, they did a beautiful job, all of them, of having EEG screening, exam screening. It wasn't just everyone that had an arrest or was encephalopathic after. It, it was a, a, a select group. OK, and now you can show hypothermia is beneficial. One thing about all of those, all of the patients that got hypothermia in all the studies were comatose. So that's num rule number one. But of those who are comatose, they were, let's face it, the patients that were comatose but were on the better end. They weren't crashing from progressive hypotension. They, they, they were patients that we kind of thought have a shot. Uh, and so number one, I think that it's only been shown to be efficacious in subgroups. Now we're kind of generalizing it and applying it to everyone. And it very well may be that in some patients who don't have a chance to be benefited from it, they're actually hurt by it because their brain can't be benefited, but their chance of getting an infection goes up. And so, so number one is, I think the clinical trials have given us some clues as to we do need as clinicians to be wise about who we cool. And so, like I say, it can't be so far gone that we're thinking they're, you know, they're so bad, they're minus 20 base deficit, a pH of 6.5 or, you know, crazy numbers. And, and they're, they're not going to have a chance at all, no matter what we do. Uh, and, and then there's the other end of the spectrum, though, that I think is really interesting, that by doing these kind of trials, that we have learned a little bit about. Because I've been wrong. I've been in this field for a long time, and I thought I knew a lot. And you do these trials, and they humble you. Here's an example. We had a kid. And it was maybe about a four-month-old who had had uh, an apneic spell that led to a cardiorespiratory arrest with RSV, a respiratory syncytial virus. And um, this child came into the unit resuscitated from its arrest. And you know, a four-month-old, what exactly is coma in a four-month-old? It can be kind of tricky. You know, obviously, in a 12-year-old, you're pretty confident to know what coma is. In a four-month-old, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a little finer line. And uh, anyway, in this four-month-old, half of the attendings in our unit said, I wouldn't cool this kid. Why are you going to enter them into the trial? This kid's going to wake up and be just fine. And the, uh, the other half said, you know, this is a threshold insult. This is the kind of patient that has the most chance of being uh, benefited from hypothermia. And uh, of course, cooling an awake patient is not a piece of cake. You have to sedate them, and et cetera. And this kid clearly was not awake, was at best, I guess you'd say, stuporous. But anyway, we got an acute MRI on this child to see what the extent of damage was. If, uh, an initial CT was totally normal. And we were really shocked at how many abnormalities there already were on MRI in this kid, which told us our initial clinical exam is not that good. And so part of the answer is, I think we don't know at the upper end who is going to be the right patient that we should make the jump and cool at the upper end. Uh, there may be, it may be like in any of these diseases, patients that are borderline have the greatest chance because they haven't had a devastating injury and maybe hypothermia has the, if you really could manage it well, has the best chance for them. We haven't defined that. Maybe things like biomarkers and, as I say, imaging and other modalities can help us come up with an algorithm of three or four or five things and say, okay, there is brain injury here. We should, we should cool. Uh, as I say, on the lower end, I think we do know, uh, we, we have a little bit of an idea that there could be some deleterious effects if we cool patients that we think have no chance at all. And, uh, and so I think we're making some inroads into that. But we need to be cognizant of those, those kind of the, the two ends of the spectrum.
Other questions? Yes? Are you talking about putting within a clinical trial? Or just no, I think we are doing it within a clinical trial. And obviously, the beauty of that is everything is so tightly controlled, and you're you're collecting data on them. And But I think uh, we reported our experience before these two clinical trials were launched. And we cooled. When the American Heart Association guidelines and ILCOR guidelines came out and said, in children, cooling is up to the discretion of the treating physician after a cardiac arrest in a child that is comatose. In our own unit in Pittsburgh, probably out of 14 attendings, 10 out of the 14 cooled. And a few of them didn't, except in a few cases. Uh, like, say, in a V-fib kid, uh, post-cardiac surgery kid might be more apt to just be cooled because it, it tends to be a witness to rest, et cetera, et cetera, you know. Um, and whereas the out of hospital, there still was a little more skepticism about it. And so uh, in our own, we, we kind of took this approach and we certainly, in general clinical applicability for a child, because the Heart Association and ILCOR guidelines say this, we would never as a team, force an attending to do something they don't, they, they don't want to do. And now, as I say, with clinical trials going on, we're a, a little step past that because the first thing is patients are offered. Do they, we had to get everyone to agree in the group. It's a big group. Yes, we will offer these trials to the families, the two different trials. And then if they refuse, the attending then still has the choice to either cool or not cool based on their own clinical. Uh, and so these kind of thoughts about who gets cooled and who doesn't are, are made every day in our unit. And uh, not every patient gets cooled. Other questions? Well, if not, thank you very much. I'll be up here a little while if you want to come up. Thank you.